Ah, the Tyrrell P34. The genius six-wheel F1 car that changed the game, destroyed the competition, only to be banned in its prime because the FIA hates clever innovation and only wants Ferrari to win. Except none of that's really true. Well, most of it isn't. In total, there were four teams that built and tested six-wheel F1 cars as late as 1982. In this video, I'm going to break down each of their histories and recreate them and their effects in the flight and physics simulator Simple Planes. Now while I show a time lapse of how I built my P34 copy, here is its story. In the early 70s, Tyrrell were very much the team to beat. With Jackie Stewart at the helm, the team cruised the 1971 and 73 titles. But by the final race of the 73 season at Watkins Glen, Jackie Stewart had long announced his retirement and his young heir apparent, Francois Sever, was tragically killed in practice. This shook the team, but despite tragedy, they remained competitive, winning races and finishing third and fifth overall in 1974 and 75. By 1976, the team desired to get back on top and introduced a radical new concept, the likes never before seen in F1. So radical, it was dismissed on launch as a mere publicity stunt, the six-wheeled P34. Tyrrell's logic was that by shrinking down the front wheels to only 10 inches and doubling them so there's four of them, it would clean up the aerodynamic profile of the car, reducing the drag by hiding the wheels behind the bodywork. Having four front wheels would also give a larger contact patch with the road for better front grip, turning force and stability. It was an idea Tyrrell's chief designer, Derek Gardner, first envisioned when he was working on the insane turbine-powered four-wheel drive Lotus 56 that competed in the Indy 500 and a handful of F1 races. Legend says the P34 fared well. It took a 1-2 finish in the Swedish Grand Prix and took Tyrrell to a third place in the 1976 championship. Sounds pretty good. But in reality, Tyrrell's conventional cars from the last two seasons had also won races and placed equally as well in the championships. It's also worth noting that the Tyrrell's main rivals that season, McLaren and Ferrari, turned up in 1976 with essentially evolutions of cars going back as 1973, and Lotus struggled with their car, the Type 77, an awkward middle child between the long outdated 72D and their first ground effect prototype, the 78, which launched the next year. For Tyrrell to present an entirely new model and still perform about the same, it kind of calls the myth of the P34 being such a great step forwards. This is backed up by the P-34's mixed receptions from those who drove it. Lead driver Jody Schechter declared it a piece of junk and was so incensed by the car he left the team at the end of the 1976 season for the debuting Walter Wolf Racing, who funnily enough actually beat Tyrrell in the championship the following season. Second driver Patrick Depayet liked the P-34, and it was interesting and promising enough that Tyrrell managed to lure the highly rated Ronnie Peterson to drive for them in 1977. To understand the car's mixed reception, let's look at how it actually works. Here is my finished recreation, and although Simple Planes is by any means not entirely accurate to scale, it's still really great for illustrating the principles on how cars like this work. While the smaller front wheels do clear airflow over the car and provide cleaner air to the rear, they also fail to divert air away from the car's largest source of drag, those huge rear wheels. The added weight of the four-wheel steering also makes the car slightly sluggish compared to its four-wheel counterpart, but it does eke out a little bit more top speed. Having four wheels at the front does improve the car's front end grip in some situations. In fast, flat sweeping corners, the car is more stable and grips better, but through tight twisty sections and bumps, this causes understeer and instability. The car's inherently stiffer setup causes the middle set of wheels to become unloaded and lift off the ground, making grip uneven and inconsistent, a complaint mirrored by its drivers. The P34 is very much a mixed bag, and any of its gains do have a trade-off. Trying to run the car had a whole host of problems too. The suspension and steering were fragile and complicated. Tire supplier Goodyear were reluctant to continue developing such small tires for only one customer when everybody else used the same standard sizes. Also, it was pretty much impossible to make effective brakes for a 10-inch wheel that wouldn't catch fire. With only limited benefits and a whole host of reliability issues, the car was shelved after a less impressive 1977 season. Coincidentally, in 1977, Lotus debuted their first ground effect car, confusingly named the 78, which was highly effective and won multiple races. The year was also marked by Renault's entry into Formula 1 with their turbo engine powered RS01. Despite its famous teething problems earning it the nickname the Yellow Teapot, it stirred up a lot of interest in the paddock as to how effective turbo engines would be in the future. Almost every team then started looking into the concept or developing it. It was clear that these were going to be the next logical steps forward in F1, not six-wheelers. In 1978, Tyrrell entered a conventional four-wheeled car, and as the season went on, they started experimenting with ground effect, adding some very obvious metal skirts to the side of the chassis, 
and it was an improvement. They did win one race and took fourth in the standings. And by 1979, like pretty much everybody else, their car was a boxy Lotus copy with long sealed side pods and underfloor aerodynamics. Six wheelers never raced again in F1. Despite Tyrrell's brief and largely unsuccessful adventure with six wheelers, by the end of 1977, it had stirred up enough interest to where two other teams had developed concepts. These never raced or really worked, but their stories are fascinating enough. First up, despite its limited gains on track, March were enamoured with the huge amount of press, buzz and toy sales the P34 generated. It instantly became arguably the most recognisable F1 car of all time and massively raised the team's profile in and out of F1. Tyrrell were onto something when they used four small wheels at the front to clean up the profile of the car, but it really made no difference in the long run as the car still had those huge 24-inch tyres for the era needed to effectively put the engine's power to use. Those huge and heavy tyres alone counted for 40% of the car's total drag. March decided they could negate a huge portion of this by shrinking down the rear tyres to the same size as the fronts, and then placing four of them in line at the rear. They dubbed this concept the 240. All four wheels were driven too, splitting the engine power across a larger contact patch than two wheels. Those large tyres also effectively geared up the car and took more force to spin up and slow down. By having four smaller wheels, it would make acceleration absolutely rapid and more controllable. The car was first tested at a press event in late 1976, and the gearbox immediately broke. To fool the journalists, March simply fit a two-wheeled gearbox and ran the car with only two driven rear wheels, not four. Considering the circuit was wet and you couldn't really push anyway, it fooled them, and the media hailed it as a huge success. Short on resources and without a permanent gearbox solution, March pretty much parked the idea until 1977. But on the 240's next outing, it completed some straight line tests at Silverstone. Driver Ian Schechter, brother of P34 pilot Jody, said the car's traction was incredible, and despite it only being driven in a straight line, it was front cover news on the next edition of Autosport. Now simulated at least, the 240 concept is fascinatingly effective. The car absolutely annihilates its four-wheel counterpart on the straights, with mind-blowing acceleration and much higher top speed due to considerably less drag. For corners, mm, different story. The 240 is incredibly long for an F1 car, and with its narrow track width and incredibly rear biased weight, it rockets in a straight line, but front grip is virtually non-existent. With all that rear traction, cornering is largely futile, an issue not helped by the car's incredibly uncivilised front aerodynamics, aimed at reducing drag, not generating downforce. Compared to its four-wheel counterpart, it is largely faster on Simple Plane's more high-speed circuits, but I'd hate to try it around somewhere like Monaco. After the second Silverstone test, the 240 was still miles off being a viable option. The car was shelved, and March went back on to trying to improve their woeful four-wheeled car. By the end of a disastrous 1977 season, where the team scored no points, they ultimately had to withdraw from Formula 1 until 1980. Despite this, as the team had predicted, the public's enduring fascination with six-wheeled cars continued. The 240 prototype generated a massive amount of income being lent out for car shows and public events, which continues to this day. The team also licensed a hugely successful Scalextric model that was in production for five years, and is still incredibly common 40 years later. Despite never racing, the 240 ended up being March's most profitable venture they ever undertook in F1. Now our third F1 six-wheeler concept comes from a strange place indeed, forever the team of traditionalism and dogma, even Ferrari caught the six-wheel bug in 1976 with their 3112T6. The idea was different to both Tyrrell and March, harking back to a pre-war auto union racer. They proposed by placing four smaller front-sized wheels on one rear axle recessed into the bodywork, they could get a larger contact patch with the road, allegedly getting a 50% increase in rear grip compared to conventional tyres. Again, it would also reduce the drag by removing the huge rear wheels. It was rumoured that despite being on the same axle, Ferrari were developing separate differentials for the inner and outer wheels, allowing them to turn at different rates and make cornering far easier, although I can't find any proof this was actually developed. The car was tested and again produced mixed results. Nicky Lauda liked the idea, but didn't count on it being their race car for 1977. The car boasted impressive top speeds and good performance around fast bank corners, but it was heavy and caused huge issues with tyre deformation, as the huge lateral forces compressed the tyres and took up to 35% of the contact patch away, negating any noticeable increase in cornering grip. Carlos Reutemann, on the other hand, found the car terrifying and complained of its stiffness and erratic behaviour over bumps. During one test, the car violently swerved left, crashing heavily and destroying its delicate rear assembly. He never drove it again, although Nicky Lauda did make a few tests in later models. 
It is worth noting that the 312T6 would have never raced anyway as it exceeded the sports regulations for maximum axle width, and Ferrari's attempt to reduce that only made the car more unstable. My model of this car is maybe my favourite out of the four I built for this video. Simple Planes is not entirely accurate with this one, so it is dramatically fast in a straight line and actually corners surprisingly well. By having the four powered wheels in a line, it eases some of the issues of the 240's freight train-like inertia, and its better chassis and aerodynamics make it handle much better. It's a really, really fun car to drive, it absolutely annihilates the straights, corner exit speed is hilarious, and it's a full 7 seconds faster than its four-wheel counterpart. Ultimately, Ferrari stopped pursuing the six-wheeler, as they already had the best cars of the era and didn't really need it. In 1977, they stormed their third successive constructors title by a considerable margin. They ceased production on the 3112T6 and focused solely on their conventional cars, finishing second in 1978 and winning again in 1979. Quite simply, no six-wheelers needed. Following 1977, not much happened on the six-wheel front in F1, because the cars were rapidly changing because of the new ground effect and turbo engine technology. It is rumoured that between 1977 and 82, both the BRM and Lotus teams were working on ideas for six-wheelers, but there's no actual proof either of these were even designed, let alone built or existed. Now, despite pioneering ground effect in Formula 1, after the 1978 season, Lotus were dogged with unsuccessful high-concept cars that too often walked the wrong side of the rulebook. In their absence, the team that ran the furthest with ground effect, without cheating, were Williams. The FW07 and FW08 cars are generally considered the best of the era. They won two drivers and consecutive titles, and were usually the team to beat each week. Now I took my Lotus 79 recreation from the last video and evolved it into the FW08. By this point, ground effect cars seldom even needed front wings because the underfloor aero generated so much downforce. It's really, really fun and fast, it handles brilliantly, it's one of the best cars I've made in this game, and it shows the rapid evolution in cars since the Lotus 79 debuted only four years earlier and despite having the same amount of power and similar weight, it's a lot faster. But it was becoming obvious the next big step in Formula 1 after ground effect was going to be turbo engines. Ferrari and Renault's turbo pace had become frightening, and Williams' chief rivals in the ground effect era Brabham were trialling BMW-made turbo engines throughout 1982. Williams couldn't find a supplier for 82 or 3, and the now 14-year-old Ford Cosworth DFE engine they were using, virtually unchanged since its introduction in 1968, struggled to match the turbos. Because of this, Williams thought outside the box and looked back on the March 240 concept from a few years earlier. On top of the increased traction and reduced drag, they discovered that with four narrower, smaller wheels, they could extend the ground effect wings on the car all the way to the back past the rear axles, increasing the downforce dramatically and giving them a possible edge in the seasons to come. Williams built two six-wheel cars, the FW07D in 1981 and the FW08D in 1982. They allegedly bested the turbo-powered Renault's lap records at the heavily power-sensitive circuit pool Ricard. The reason this worked, largely was because traditional ground effect cars needed draggy high-angled rear wings to balance the huge amount of front center downforce generated by the underfloor wings. But with the six-wheeler, and the wings now extended all the way to the rear axles, they no longer had to fit around the huge rear tyres. This meant Williams could considerably reduce the rear wing angle, which made the car incredibly sleek and less draggy. The six-wheel car reportedly had almost double the lift-to-drag ratio of the four-wheeled version. And my recreation shows this impact. The six-wheeler is monstrously fast in a straight line, leaving its four-wheel counterpart for dust, and with the increased downforce from the extended ground effect wings, it rockets round a circuit much, much faster. All I changed with these two cars was made the rear wheels the same size as the fronts, extended the ground effect wings to the back of the car, resized the side skirts accordingly, and then trimmed out the rear wing until the car was balanced. It drives like it's absolutely on rails and carries so much more speed into the corners. Concept alone, the six-wheel Williams was a huge step forward. Sadly, due to the increasingly exotic and fast cars, the 1982 season saw numerous fatalities and career-ending injuries for drivers. The cars were simply too fast for the sport's primitive safety measures at the time. This prompted the FIA to make sweeping rule changes for 1983, banning ground effect cars for good. They also tightened up a number of theoretical loopholes, restricting cars to only four wheels, two being driven, banning all-wheel drive, and a few others. Now, I have found conflicting sources as to whether the six-wheel ban was a direct response to Williams' alleged gains, or simply a means of streamlining the formula and stopping this nonsense for good. But in reality, the six-wheel Williams was a very long way off actually racing. 
According to Williams engineer Frank Durney, the car was heavy, complicated and needed bespoke parts that were in short supply, including gearboxes, tyres and suspension. There's a BBC documentary from 1981 called Gentlemen Lift Your Skirts, which is about the ground effect era. A portion of this film shows Williams turning up to testing in 1981 without any tyres for their car, because they couldn't get them. They had to go borrow some that were the wrong size from the Arrows team. The sport was just a mess back then, it wasn't anywhere near as organised or taken seriously as it is now. Around this period, Williams were always short of money and time as they were also trying to pursue an early form of active suspension that didn't debut until the late 80s. They were trying to negotiate a deal for turbo engines with Honda and fighting for the 1982 and 81 titles. Like all other F1 six-wheelers, it was pretty much killed by impracticality and the sport's just lack of organisation at the time. With the so-called draconian and regressive FIA rules being pretty much just the last nail in the coffin. As much as people like to say it, the FIA don't hate ingenuity and don't stop cars from racing, it's not that simple. Anyway, that's the video for today, I hope you all like this. It's been really fun to make all these cars and finally go in depth on a topic that's fascinated me for pretty much my whole life. I'd love if you gave the video a like, if you enjoyed it, leave a comment, talk about anything you want me to kind of recreate next. Also give a sub to my channel if you haven't already for more Simple Planes content. I also do weekly live streams across a whole variety of genres and a whole bunch of other stuff too. I have a really great active Discord community with about 150 members, links in the description, come join the discussion there. Until next time, have a great one, cheers, bye.